the Bible reveals and declares to us not only that God is, but God's character. And this is what we need to know. That the most important thing in life is to know God. Amen. Uh, again, it's so good to see you guys today. We are back in uh, the God series where we're just turning our attention to the Lord and his attributes and his nature. And these first four sermons or so have just been focusing on God as Trinity. And because of that, uh, if you've been with us, you've noticed that we keep bumping into and have been talking about in almost every sermon, this thing called the Nicene Creed. Some of you know that. Some of you are scared when I say those words. Hang with me. The Nicene Creed is a very ancient uh, Christian creed that was first written in AD 325. So it's very, very old. And it was a way for some of the early church fathers, the, 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 this group of bishops to come together to sort of put on the paper what the Bible reveals about the nature of God, particularly the Trinity. So we find out a lot about the Trinity in the Nicene Creed. And I, and I thought, well, we've been talking about it so much. We keep referencing it. Why don't we just read it today uh, and just hear it for ourselves? And uh, one of the reasons I want to do that today is because today is the fourth sermon, which means we did Trinity, then Father, Son, and Spirit. So one, two, three, four, is that four? That's four. Uh, so we're on the sermon about the Spirit. And I thought, well, let's, let's come to the Creed and let's see what we can discover about the Holy Spirit from the, the early church fathers, the Nicene Creed. What can we discover about them? So today I'm going to read it for you, the whole thing. It's not crazy long. And maybe you just get, get a pen and paper out and you can take some notes. What, what, what you hear, you can pen it down and we'll talk about it. Okay, here we go. Uh, I'll try to be fast. The Nicene Creed 325 edition. <clears throat> We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth and of all things visible and invisible. There's the Father. And in one Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the only begotten, begotten of the Father before all ages. Remember this? Light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made of one essence with the Father by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary and became a man. He was crucified for us under Pontius Pilate, suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven. He sits at the right hand of the Father. He shall come again with glory to judge the living and the dead whose kingdom shall have no end. And in the Holy Spirit, the end. I heard this for the first time in seminary. I think I laughed out loud when I heard that. I was like, is that, is that, the, that's it? That's all we got. That's all we got. That's it. Now don't be scared. Uh, they, they were Trinitarians. Uh, let me uh, maybe clarify why there's only five words about the Holy Spirit in here. Uh, one, they, they actually came back in 381 and they, um, uh, sort of made some of the language more robust. So we got 25 words in 381. Okay. Uh, but, uh, one of the reasons that we only have five words here is the point of this particular creed was not to focus on the spirit. They, this convention was called, this council was called to focus on the son. There were issues around the son of God, which makes sense because there's so much there about the son, clarifying who he is, who he was before the incarnation, all that. So it's doing a lot of that work. But there's maybe another reason why there's so much brevity about the Holy Spirit here, and that is if we can just be honest with ourselves when we come to the scriptures, there's just a quite a bit less real estate given to the, to the person and role of the Holy Spirit than there is the Son or the Father. When you come to the New Testament, Jesus is blowing up every page. Details about him, his life, death, burial, resurrection, the Spirit. He's there, but not quite as much. So I, I think there's reasons for that, which we'll talk about later. But one of the things this has meant for us over the course of church history is there's been a lot of misunderstanding about who he is, who the Spirit of God is. 
And maybe some of you have experienced that yourself. We're all here at Stonegate, but all of us have come from various churches, maybe uh, over time in our life, and you've experienced different sort of sides of the aisle when it comes to the Holy Spirit. Some of you are here, and you came from a church where you never heard about the Holy Spirit, right? It was, he was never mentioned. He was never showing up to the party on a Sunday morning. It was the Father, Son, and the Holy Bible. That's what it was, right? And it was weird. It was like, I thought there were three, I thought there was a spirit, right? And, and so coming here, maybe the, talking about them at all feels odd to you. And maybe on this side of the spectrum, there's others of you in here who, it was, it was the spirit 24-7, right? It was the power hour. That's all we're doing. Like that's, that's all we're focusing on. And, and you probably own a tambourine and you probably got some flags and you probably uh, play an instrument. That's my guess, right? If you're here. And I'm so glad you're here too, but maybe you're from that sort of side of the spectrum. There's different ways that the church has, has tried to handle or not handle the Holy Spirit. And it's been confusing. So today, all I want us to do is just come around God's word. That's a good idea, isn't it? Just come around God's word and just go, well, what does God's word say about him? Who is he? And we're going to treat this day just like we have been doing over the past uh, handful of sermons. We're going to ask the same sets of questions about this person of the Trinity. We're going to ask, who is he? Right? So, so who is the Holy Spirit? That's question one today. And then the second question is just simply, what does he do? So who is he and what does he do? That's what we looked at with the sun last time. That's what we're looking at today with the spirit. And uh, so again, if you have your Bibles, get it out. Uh, we, I, I think th this morning was crazy. We had a, it, it was a mess up here for first service, but we don't have uh, scriptures on the screen. So you might have your Bible out, flip with me. You can maybe pen and paper it uh, and uh, we'll go from there. Uh, did we get it on the screen? We didn't get it on the screen. It's fine. Uh, and right now we're going to take that first question. And the first question is, who is the Holy Spirit? Let's, let's do our best to answer that from the scripture. What can we say about him? Uh, well, I think maybe the, the first and clearest thing to say about him is the Holy Spirit is the third person of the Trinity. He's the third person of the Trinity. Now, I want to slow down over that sentence for a second. First thing I want you to see is this. He's the third person of the Trinity. If you happen to be a member of the Trinity, what does that make you? God. It makes you God. Yeah. None of you are uh, members of the Trinity. You're not God. Uh, the Holy Spirit is a member of the Trinity, which makes him God. We spent uh, a sermon, the very first sermon in our series, um, explaining how that's so, where the Bible talks about that. Acts chapter 5, Peter calls him God. Uh, 2 Corinthians, Paul says the Spirit, the Lord is the Spirit. So, so he is Yahweh. He is God. That's true. I just want you to hold on to that. The Spirit is God. He's the third person of the Trinity. But he's also the third person of the Trinity. So he's God, but he's also the third person of the Trinity. Now I want to stress this word person here because this is where a lot of us get it twisted. We get it wrong. Even uh, folks outside the church and even Christians, people within the church get this wrong. A lot of us mistakenly talk about the Holy Spirit of God like he's a force, right? Or, or, or an energy or a cloud or a vibe. We even have words and sentences for it in our culture, like the spirit of the age, right? We mean like the, the mood of the age, like how people are thinking and operating. Or, or you might, in Christian context, say, I got caught up in the spirit. Like I walked into the room, was hit by this, you know, mist, right? And now I'm, I'm different, right? Like he's some kind of a, like cologne or something. And, and I just want to clarify, the Bible does not say he's cologne. That's not what it teaches. The Bible is very clear. Our God, this third person of the Trinity, is a person. He has all the attributes of personhood. So for instance, uh, the Holy Spirit has a will. He wills things. He does things. Acts 20, 28 says that it's the Spirit who appoints elders in the church, in the church of Ephesus. He, like he appointed elders to the church. Colognes can't appoint elders. That's one of the things about a cologne that it can't do. Uh, there's other things. Um, it, it, the Spirit has a mind, right? Uh, so uh, Romans 8, 27, he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is. He knows what the, it's, it's, the Spirit is thinking things. Persons think things. He has emotions. Some of you know this verse, Ephesians 4, 30, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. Do you know he can be grieved? He can feel sadness. Again, these are, these are personal attributes, aren't they? These are what persons experience. He's a he. Not that he's gendered, but the Bible only uses masculine pronouns to talk about him. So he is never an it when he shows up in scripture. It's always he will do, he will come, he will do this, 
right? So all of those attributes communicate this. The Holy Spirit is a person. He is the third person of the Trinity, it, within the economy of the Trinity. So now let's talk about that piece of it. We're still thinking about who he is. Who is he? Third person of the Trinity. Well, what is his relationship like with inside the Trinity? We spent a little bit of time last time, you know, we talking about the Son and, and his relationship with inside the, the Trinity. And we said the Son is the eternally begotten one, right? It's in, it's in his name. He's the son. He's begotten of the father. Right? He, he, he comes from the father in that way. He's generated from the father. That's Jesus' relationship. What can we say about the spirit? Like how, how are we to understand the spirit within the context of the Trinity? Well, the Bible teaches that if the son is eternally begotten of the father, the, the spirit eternally proceeds from the father and the son. The Holy Spirit eternally proceeds from the Father and the Son. This is the language, this is not my language, this is the language of the Bible. So when Jesus is teaching his disciples in John 15, he'll say something like this, verse 26. He says, but when the helper comes, that's the Holy Spirit, whom, listen to this, I will send you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness to me. So in the relationship of the Trinity, the Spirit is the preceding one. He's not the begotten one. He's the preceding one. He's the sent one. Sent from the Father. Sent from the Son. The theological word for this is spiration. Anybody use that this week in a sentence? Probably not. Spiration. It, it mean, it's an old word we don't use anymore that means to breathe or to breathe out. You can actually hear it in the name Spirit. Spirit spirates. The Spirit spirates. He is breathed out from the Father and the Son. Now, all this is really weird, right? Can we just agree? Like, we don't, what are we talking, the Trinity? It's so, it's so bizarre. I've been wrestling over the years trying to get my head and heart around this to make sense of it. And I'll tell you, one person who's been really helpful to me on my journey has been Augustine. St. Augustine, 5th century, he was the 5th century uh, Bishop of Hippo. Now, the Bishop of Hippos, that'd be amazing. He was the Bishop of a place called Hippo. He, uh, he, when he talked about the relationship of the Spirit to the Father and the Son, here's how he talked about it. He'll, he'll say that the Father is the lover. And the Son is the beloved. He is the object of the Father's love. The, the Father eternally loves the Son. So the Father's the lover. The Spirit is the beloved. And the Spirit then is the love that proceeds from both of them. So if you could imagine for a moment, if, if the love between the Father and the Son had personhood, was personal. Like it wasn't just like a feeling, but it was actually personal. If you could imagine that love having personhood, you'd be getting close to how we should think about the Holy Spirit inside the Trinity. Father, lover, son, beloved, spirit, the love between them. Personal, personhood, love. Yeah, so he eternally proceeds from the Father and the Son, and then he's sent out into the world. Yeah? Okay, that's, that's a big, 10% underst understanding? Yeah? I, we can get down with 10%. I mean, it's, you know, we'll have eternity to figure this thing out. So he's the third person of the Trinity who eternally proceeds from the Father and the Son. Now let's, let's, we have a sense of the who that he is now. This is who he is. Now let's talk about what he does. What is his role? What does he do? How would you answer that question? If somebody says, what does is, what is the Holy Spirit do? What would you say? Uh, as I'm studying this, the, 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 the shortest way I could find to talk about it is everything. He t just everything. I just can't. In fact, studying this week, I kind of got overwhelmed because I'm reading it. I'm like, oh, it's like I can't find things he doesn't do. Like the Holy Spirit is doing everything. He is the Father's agent in everything. Everything the Father is about doing. The Spirit is behind it. It's, it's wild. The Spirit, if, the, if something's going to get done, the Spirit's getting it done. So let me give you just a quick list of it uh, so you can kind of get a sense of my overwhelmment this week. So creation of the world, yeah, right? Uh, uh, the second verse of the Bible, the Spirit was hovering over the, the waters, or hovering over the deep, that he was there at the new earth, caring for it, molding it. The Holy Spirit speaks through the prophets. Like every time a prophet prophesies in the Old Testament, if it's true, it's coming from the Spirit. The, he, the Holy Spirit wrote the Bible. 
The second Peter 1.21, that men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. That's how Peter talks about how the Bible came to be, that carried along by the Holy Spirit, men put pen to paper. And they, and they wrote, he wrote the Bible, he enables creativity. We see that in the Old Testament. He empowers people for works of service. Even in the role of the Son, the Spirit is operating behind it. So like um, everything with the sun. Hello everyone. My name is Sean Varghese. This is my wife, Jessie. Today we are dedicating run. our baby girl, Leah Karras That's what it's going to sound like. She was born no. on March 24, So you thought it was a trumpet, but it's, uh, it's actually kind of sounds like something Apple did. Okay. Even Jesus' works, the spirit is working behind it. Let me, let me demonstrate that to you. That was my favorite thing that's happened in a long time. Um, the birth of Jesus, Matthew 118, Mary was found to be with child from whom? From the Holy Spirit. It's from the Holy Spirit. The ministry of Jesus, Acts 10, 38. G God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. Then it says, he went about doing good and healing those who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. The sacrifice of Jesus. You think Jesus on the cross, you're thinking that moment. Did, did you know the Bible says the Holy Spirit was working to produce that? So, Hebrews 9.14, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify your conscience. So, so he offered himself to God, spilling his blood through the eternal spirit. Even the resurrection of Jesus, the spirit is working to achieve that. Romans 1.4, Jesus was declared to be the son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead. It was according to the spirit that Jesus was raised. So birth, life, death, ministry, re resurrection, the whole, the spirit is behind it. Then the spirit comes and he gives life to the church. He gives gifts to the church. He bears fruit in believers' lives. He convicts the world of sin and righteousness of judgment. My point is he does a lot, right? He does a lot. He's all over the place. He's working in so many things. And if we looked at all of it this morning, we'd be here for a minute. So we're not going to be doing that, okay? We're actually going to really narrow our focus and not tackle everything the Spirit is about and does. What we're doing this morning is zooming in on just this thing, just this question. What does He do in our redemption? What does the Spirit do? I, I want you to think about that. What does He do for our salvation, in our redemption. What is he doing there? That's kind of how we thought about the sun last week too, right? When we were thinking about the sun last week, I said, I gave you a word to kind of put on top of the sun to explain what the role of the sun in our redemption. Does anybody remember that word? You shout it out. Let's get charismatic. What do we got? Access. That the great banner hanging over the Son of God is this word access. The Son tears the curtain, gives us access to come in to the Father's presence. He gives us access. Well, if that's the, the work of the Son in our redemption, what can we say about the work of the Spirit? Well, if the word for the Son is access, then the phrase for the Spirit is going to be access granted. Access granted. M meaning... The Holy Spirit takes what the Father arranged before the foundations of the earth for your salvation. He takes what the Father arranged and what the Son achieved and He applies it to you. I'm going to say that again. The Spirit takes what the Father arranged and then what the Son achieved at Calvary and He then applies it to you. He makes it personal. He, the, the veil is torn and the Spirit goes, let's get in there. That's the role of the Spirit. He brings us into the Father's presence. The Son has cleared the way and the Spirit brings us in. The Spirit is access granted. Now he does that in three ways. Three ways. And this will be the, kind of the rest of our time together this morning. He secures us, he matures us, and he assures us. I love when stuff rhymes. It's great. And that, that made me happy. He secures us, he matures us, and he assures us. Let me show you what I mean. Uh, let's first talk about him securing us. The Spirit of God secures us. Now, when I use that word secure, I mean it kind of like you would say, um, hey, I secured us the tickets for the game, right? 
What I mean when I say that is, I got them. I got the tickets, right? That's the work of the Spirit. The Spirit is the one who goes and gets us. He secures us, right? Because it is, it's one thing for the Father before the foundation of the world to set his affection on you and say, I want you. So it's one thing for him to arrange your salvation. It's one thing for the Son to come and die for you to achieve your salvation. But even after all that work, you're still not saved. Why? Because you don't care about God, right? You don't care, you don't care that he died. Like you're not interested in him. Your heart, your heart is cold. You're what the Bible calls spiritually dead. This is how the Bible talks about every person on earth apart from the work of the spirit inside them that we are spiritually dead people. That's who we are. There's no life in us to do anything. Uh, there was a, an analogy that uh, we loved to use in the 90s when we were sharing the gospel with people as Christians. Uh, it, was like, um, it, it was like a boat lifesaver analogy. And you say, you know, you're, you, you're lost at sea. You're out there and you're doggy paddling and, and, and you're trying to stay afloat. And, and God is in his boat over here. And you see him and, and he sees you and, and he throws you his lifesaver. And that lifesaver is the cross, right? And it hits the water. And all you got to do is you got to wade over to the lifesaver you got to put your arm around. He's going to pull you into that boat. The cross. He will save you by the work of Jesus. Just, just grab hold of it. Just paddle over and grab it. And it's beautiful. And it feels like powerful. The only problem with it is you're not doggy paddling. Right? You're, you're not floating above water and you spot God. The Bible says you're a corpse at the bottom of the Atlantic. Right? And I don't know if you know this, but corpses don't do much. Right? Dead people don't grab things. And that's the problem with the picture. You weren't just here wanting to grab it. You weren't conscious spiritually. You were spiritually dead. This is how Ephesians 2 talks about it. That you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you formerly walked. Right? This is how the Bible speaks of our condition. So the big question really is, how is a dead you ever going to grab God? That's the question that you got to solve. This was the tension in the Old Testament. This was the big dilemma throughout all of the Old Testament with the people of God. This issue, what are we going to do about it? um, One of the saddest uh, moments in the Old Testament, for me anyways, uh, happens right after Moses comes down and gives Israel the Ten Commandments. You can see it in Exodus 20, uh, uh, but you can see it um, in a different way in uh, Deuteronomy 5. He comes down from the mountain, he gives the Ten Commandments. We know the Ten Commandments, right? He gives the Ten Commandments and the people now are interacting with Moses after hearing God's law. And they're fired up. They're like, well, God's so intense. You go deal with God for us. And whatever he says... We want to let you know, Moses, we're going to do it. That's what they say. We are fired up, man. We're going to do this thing. You can go read it yourself. It's Deuteronomy 5. This is what they say. And, and do you know what God says back to them, to their zeal, to their passion, to, to go follow after the ways of God? Here's what God says in Deuteronomy 5, 29. He says this. Oh, that they had such a heart in them, that they would fear me and keep my commandments always. He looks at them and their big words and he says, you just don't have the heart. You don't have the heart for what you think you can do. You cannot do the things you claim because deep down at the core of who you are, you're not alive. You have no appetite for me. You have no interest in me. And we watch that truth play out through the whole rest of the Old Testament as Israel just continues to fail and fumble and refuses to follow God and chases after every other thing to be their God except Yahweh. And it spirals down and down until eventually they're exiled out of the land. Jerusalem's destroyed. Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians take them captive and they're in this awful place and they're going, what do we do? What have we done? How do we fix this thing? enter the prophet Ezekiel who during the Babylonian captivity God gives him a word to speak to the people of Judah and it's written down in Ezekiel 36 and it's one of the most powerful promises in the Old Testament foreshadowing what's coming one day how God's going to solve this problem of our spiritual deadness our disinterest in him here's what he says in Ezekiel 36 verses 26 and 27 God's talking Through Ezekiel, he says this, and I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put 
within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statues and be careful to obey my rules. God said, you really can't do this thing. So I'm going to do it for you. I'm going to do this for you. I'm going to send my spirit. He's going to take up residence inside you and things are going to change. You're going to come alive. The, the scriptural word, the, the theological word for this is regeneration, that we are regenerated, generated again. This is what Jesus had in mind in John 3 when he says, you must be born again. He's talking about regeneration. We need to come to life. And I love that analogy because it removes my agency in it, doesn't it? But being born, any of you guys just willed yourself into existence? Is that how we got here? You're like, I want to be born I'm born, right? That's, that would be really weird. Uh, that's not how any of us came to be, right? We came to be because of another, and that's exactly how the Bible talks about our salvation. We came to be alive because of another, because of the work of God through his Holy Spirit in us. Uh, let me say it uh, another way. There was, one, there was a day when you didn't care about Jesus, right? If you're in here and you love Jesus today, there was a day when you didn't. You thought he was boring, or you thought he was a bad guy, right? You just, you, you had a negative view of him, and, and, the, and the scripture was dull, and what's the point of church, and who are these people, and they're all just hypocrites, there was, there was that day. And then there was a day when you didn't feel that way. Then there was a day when Jesus came alive to you, and, and, and you saw him clearly, and the cross made sense. It wasn't just a necklace anymore, and you fell in love, and you're like, oh, he's my everything. I want to be here with these people, and I'm changed. There was a day. And what I'm saying is the only difference between those two days is not you. It's the work of the Holy Spirit. He regenerated you. He came into your system disrupting what you wanted and wakened you to life. That's how the Bible talks about it. He secured you, gave you a new heart, regenerated you. You know what this means? You know this should make us feel really humble. You didn't get here because you're great or you figured it out or you're smarter than your neighbor. You got here because one day the Spirit of God awakened your affections. You didn't care, then you did. And the Bible doesn't give us credit in that. It says the, it's the work of the Spirit. He secures you. Man, that's good news. He secures you. But he doesn't just secure you. He matures you. The Spirit secures us and he matures us. Now, I'm going to read a verse uh, to you, uh, 2 Corinthians 3, 17 and 18. I feel like I quote this a lot up here, but it's just because it's so good. So, cut me a break. Um, he, here it is. It says this, this is from Paul to the Corinthians. Now the, the Lord is the Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into that same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. That's a lot of words. Let me break it down to its simplest parts. Paul is trying to explain to these people how we grow as Christians. Yeah? And what he says is, the way we grow as Christians is we're being transformed to look more like our Lord, to look more like Jesus. We're being transformed to look more like him. And then at the end of that verse, he says, and that transformation comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. He's saying, you growing and maturing to look more like Christ happens because the Spirit makes it happen in you. So he doesn't just go and get you. He doesn't just secure you. The Spirit actually matures you as well. Point. The, the only reason you look more like Jesus this year than last year, if that's true, is because the Spirit of God has worked in you. He's done the thing. He takes the credit. This is why Paul can talk so uh, funny to the Corinthians in, in 1 Corinthians 15. He says this to him. <clears throat> he says, hey, for I'm, for I'm the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called apostle because I, I persecuted the church. And he says, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. And this grace toward me was not in vain, but on the contrary, I worked harder than any of them. 
He's talking about the apostles, by the way. He's like, I worked harder than Peter. I worked harder than James. John, I worked harder than James. Don't even get me started on James, right? He's, he's going like, I worked harder than the apostle. That's, those are some big words. But then listen to how he ends. He says this, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is in me. So what he says to the Corinthians is, hey, I, I worked harder than any of them. I did it, but I didn't really do it. It was the work of God, and it was the grace of God given me, empowering me by his Holy Spirit that actually enabled me to do any of the good that you're seeing being produced in my life. God did it in me. That's how it works. Uh, for us to act then like we mature ourselves, like we're doing it ourselves, it's inappropriate. It'd be like if you heard the Incredible Hulk uh, bragging one day about how good he was at smashing stuff, right? He's like, Hulk s smash, uh, just because Hulk can smash. Hulk really good at smashing. You're like, no, uh, Hulk not smash, just because Hulk really good at smash. Uh, Hulk, Hulk smash because uh, Hulk Bruce Banner and Bruce Banner exposed to gamma radiation and Bruce become Hulk and now Hulk smash, right? You don't, Hulk didn't smash just because he can't, like, you're green for a reason, man. You know what I mean? Like you didn't just wake up. Like something happened in you that changed you constitutionally. And so now you can do things you couldn't do before. You're empowered in a way that you weren't before. Now I'm saying this because I think that helps shape us even as we think about ourselves in the Christian life. Like are you hitting home runs right now spiritually? You might be. That's amazing. Like, are you, are you seeing growth in your life? Are you, do you love Jesus more now than you did before? Are you uh, growing in your kindness toward your family? Or, uh, are you sharing the gospel with folks at work? Are you seeing boldness show up? Do you have more faith? In are you seeing any of that stuff? If you are, be careful how you're talking about it. Because those things are not taking place because you're just killing the game. God actually ultimately takes the credit for it. Anything good in me is showing up because of him. The spirit of God matures me. So, so I worked harder than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God working in me. That's how a Christian talks. He matures us. But now, uh, briefly, let's talk about how he does it. So he matures us, but now I want to ask, how does the spirit mature us? Is it just power, just vibes he gives us. Well, let's go back to the text. Let's look at first Corin or second Corinthians and see what he says about it. In verse 18, listen to this again. Uh, Paul says this, and we all Christians with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord are being transformed. And then he says, the spirit is the one who does that in you. So how does the spirit mature us? The answer is by turning our eyes to Jesus. He causes our gaze to go to the Son of God. And as we gaze on him, we're changed to look more like him. That's how the Spirit changes us. Maybe you could think about it like this. Like if, if our redemption were like a, a movie. I'm into movies, so this analogy helps me. If it's not helpful for you, that's fine. If our redemption were like a movie, you might think of the Father like the director. Yeah? He, he, it's his film. He's telling his story that he once conveyed, right? So he's the director of this thing. The son, well, who's the son? The son is really the star of the show, isn't he? He's the lead actor. He's the guy on the screen. He's the guy who came and did the thing, right? He lived for us, died for us, rose for us. He's the star of the show. Well, if the father's the director and the son is the star, well, then who's the spirit? Well, the spirit is the cinematographer, isn't he? Because what does the cinematographer do? The cinematographer is in charge of what you see. He takes the director's vision and he makes sure that's the thing that's on your screen. This is the work of the Holy Spirit in our life. He takes our heart's camera and he just, whoo, and he points it at Jesus and he says, stare right there. Stay there. Go in tight. Move in slow. Yes. 
right? That's his work to get us enamored with the star of the show, King Jesus. That's why he brings to our mind what Jesus says. That's why he reminds us of his promises. That's why he does all these things because his job is to keep Jesus in center screen. I think this is why the New Testament focuses so much more on the the work and role and accomplishments of Jesus than it does the Spirit because cinematographers don't take selfies, They film the star. That's what they do. The spirit is happiest when the sun's on the screen. This is why we focus so much on the the person and accomplishments of Jesus Christ here at Stonegate. Because that's actually the way we glorify the spirit of God. We glorify the spirit because what the spirit wants most is for us to glorify the sun. Right? The The triune God is into glorifying each member of himself. And this is the work of the Spirit. To keep our heart's gaze fixed on Jesus. So you want to honor the the Spirit of God today? Here's the best thing you can do. You keep Jesus on your screen. You keep his accomplishments for you in, in just dead center on your screen. You gaze at the sun and you will glorify the Spirit. That's what he's about. This is how he matures us. So... He secures us. He matures us. Last thing and then we're done. He assures us. The Spirit of God assures us. One more passage with you. We're in the book of Galatians now. Paul's writing. Galatians chapter 4 verses 4 through 6. Paul says this. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Paul is explaining what God did to save us in this verse. That's what he's doing. And he's saying, God sent Jesus to redeem you. Then Jesus came sent from God, and he redeemed you. He made you sons. He took you out of Satan's kingdom, and he put you in his kingdom. That's what he did. But that positional change of being in the kingdom of darkness, coming over to the kingdom of Christ, that positional change still needs to be felt by us, doesn't it? It still needs to be felt by us. So what does God do? He says it in the text. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. What does he mean? What is he saying? He's saying God sends his spirit into our hearts to feel experientially what we already are positionally. God sends his spirit into our hearts to feel experientially what we already are positionally. We've been transferred into his kingdom. I see it on the paper, but I need to have it hit my chest. Enter the spirit of God. That's what he does. He awakens in us a sense of, oh, I am his. He assures me of my salvation. He assures us we belong to God. I remember feeling this for one of the first times when I was in college. I was at A&M and I was wrestling with different things at the time. And it wasn't that I wasn't chasing the Lord. I really was. I was in his word all the time. I was praying to him, but there was just a hollowness to that that time with him. I, I lacked a sense of, I saw it on the page, but I didn't feel it in my chest. It was just in one of those seasons. You know those seasons? And, and I'm there with the Lord and I'm reading John 10 at the time. John 10 is all about the Lord being the good shepherd. Jesus is the good shepherd. He lays down his life for his sheep. And I'm reading this. I'm, I, my mind knows it's beautiful. My mind knows that's, that would change everything if I felt that, but I just didn't feel it. And I remember just in that moment praying a short little prayer. I said, Lord, would you minister to me? I don't even know what I meant when I said, I just said, Lord, would you minister to me? And as soon as I prayed that, in that moment, it was like God cracked open my heart. And he just, for the next half hour or so, just poured in his love to me. I started uh, just crying. I like cried for like a whole 30 minutes, just I, I, I know that you're the good shepherd, but now I feel it. Now I've, I, I feel you coming around me. Now I, I see how you're protecting me from the wolves. Now I see how you're leading me beside still waters and green pastures. I feel that. If there's something different that takes place when the Spirit of God assures us of our salvation. 
this is one of his roles for us. And look, I'm not saying we, we live for chasing feelings. That's not what I'm saying. But I'm saying God does care that we feel what's true. He wants that for us. And the Spirit does that in us. I don't know where you're at right now. Maybe, maybe you're hearing this and you've been chasing the Lord. You're walking with him. You're not in some like gross sin that you haven't confessed to him or anything like that. That might keep you far off from him. But you're actually wholeheartedly trying to chase after him. But when you come to the word, it just, it feels cold. You feel hollow. There's, there's something, the, the affection's not there. Can, can I tell you, this news is a gift to you today. God is inviting you to benefit from his spirit, the helper who's in you today. Maybe the most Christian thing you could do this morning is just get alone with God today after this service. Grab your Bible, have the promises leap out of the scriptures at you, but then, but then slow down over them and go, God, I, I know it's on the page, but will you get it in my heart? I have it in my brain, but will you move it down to my chest? God, please assure me that I'm yours. What a gift that this, this isn't just, we say it a lot, this isn't just a brain game here as Christians. It's not just intellectual assent to a few ideas about a, a man on a cross 2,000 years ago. It's God in your chest awakening in you a love for God at the cross. This is what he does. And he wants to do it for you. Christian, benefit from that. Get alone with him today. Ask him for those things. He wants to give that to you. I'm not saying we live in those, those feelings, but I'm, I'm saying it is a gift from God to us. The helper is with us always to do that kind of work. And man, if you don't know the Lord this morning, I just invite you to come to him. He, the, our God has laid down his life to purchase for you his presence forever. This isn't just data. This is a real thing that's taken place that when you trust in the Son, he really, does, he really does make things new in you. You get a new heart, new affections. Are you in the same ruts that you've always been that you never change? You need a new heart this morning. And the Spirit of God provides that for us. What a kindness to, to you. Would you trust in the Son this morning and experience the, the benefits of knowing our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus, through the power of the Holy Spirit? He secures us, He matures us, and He assures us to the end. Amen? Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for not leaving us as orphans in the world, but after you took up Jesus after the resurrection, when He ascended, those days later, you sent your spirit to be with us forever. We are never not with you. You're not just distant out there in heaven. And one day when we die, man, we'll finally get to be with you. God, you're with us now. In the songs we're about to sing, God, you, you are, by your spirit, awakening in us a gladness to testify. Our God is three in one. I boast in him. I love him. Praise forever to the King of Kings. This, that's your work in us. We didn't come up with those affections. We didn't come, you did that and you do that in us. And God, I pray that you'd have mercy on this room and awaken in all of us a desire to see the triune God glorified. We love you and we give you thanks for this morning and for your word. In Jesus' name, amen.